This is the I'm Possible Project Show, where we interview real people who have achieved incredible feats in the face of overwhelming odds, showing that impossible is just the state of mind and that anything is possible. I'm your host, Joshua Rivadol. Today, in episode 16, Opening Doors Without Keys, I talk to Jill McMahon. Let's jump right in. Jill McMahon, no relation to Vince or Ed. Jill McMahon is a licensed professional counselor, and she works as a suicide grief specialist in Phoenix, Arizona. She has specialized in working with survivors of suicide loss, facilitating support groups, and working with survivors individually for over 16 years. She can also be found providing suicide prevention presentations and trainings around the community, as well as speaking about survivors of suicide nationally and internationally. To blow off steam and create balance, Jill teaches indoor cycling classes, listens to loud music, and indulges on cookie dough regularly. My kind of gal, <laughs> minus the cycling classes, because I don't get my butt moving. Jill, so glad to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Hollywood. How are you? Oh, Hollywood is good. Since you called me that, we're going to have to refer to ourselves in the third person for the entire interview. Just kidding. <laughs> Scary. Thank you. Thank you for fun. choosing me as one of your guests. That's that's an honor. Oh, hell yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, you've got a lot of good things to say, and I like what you got going on, and I like who you are. And it was great to see you at the Suicidology Conference a couple months yeah. back, and here we are. And you've got a story in our new Lemonade Stand book coming out this August 2017, so lots of, lots of connections there. Pretty cool. Exciting stuff. So, Jill... You know, I read this that little bio that, that you actually sent over for the book, but you're way more than that. You have a lot more going on. So I'm curious for our listeners and for myself, would you give us a little background on your life, where you've been, where you're going? Maybe give us the Jill McMahon experience. <laughs> Um, I, you know what? I, I think everybody's complicated. I'm just as complicated as everyone else, you know, really kind of. I'm that regular girl that had that Pollyanna upbringing, you know, middle class. My family was intact. Everybody's healthy. And for some strange reason, you know, my path led me to counseling. I think that's because I was always that girl in high school that everybody wanted to gossip with. Um, and I was just always an objective listener. So I started a counseling degree after college, uh, really thought that I was going to be a marriage and family therapist, ended up finding that I have a really um, bizarre but, but very deep passion for grief and survivors of suicide. So friends and family members that have lost someone to suicide. And this is really not where I saw life taking me, um, but it's really what I believe has been my calling. I'm, I love my work. I love the fact that people trust me, that I get to hold their hand, that I get to walk through their darkest moments with them. Um, and kind of hold them and then, you know, turn around and provide hope for them. That's one of, that's, that's Jill version one. Jill version two is, you know, I live in the very hot as hell desert. I'm married to my high school sweetheart. I have two kids. I raise a 13 year old and an 18 year old at the same time. And kind of as, um, you know, I wrote in the bio to kind of blow off steam. I'm a indoor cycling instructor as well. So I wear a lot of hats and make life really interesting think we have a choice to make life interesting or not. That's me in a oh, nutshell. Oh, yeah, we do. Oh, yeah, yeah. We do. That's a big nutshell. There's a couple nutshells there, actually. <laughs> I am a nut. Well, join the club. Gosh. 13 and 18, I know why you got to blow off steam. I have some, some teenagers at home who I love, but, you know, you got to blow off some steam sometimes. Teenage problems oh, are yeah. very interesting, to say the least. <laughs> Will we work in the same field, too, which is probably the last place I ever thought I'd be growing up or even you know, eight, nine years ago before my father died by suicide. Now, you you kind of have this Wonder Bread thing going on, high school sweetheart, two kids, you're a cycling instructor, like how much whiter could you be? But <laughs> <laughs> please, Jill, play into the stereotype some more. <laughs> I was just skinny vanilla latte right now. You literally could not have said that any better, and it is so true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But with with any sort of white picket fence, there's always something on the other side. We see one side mm -hmm. from the outside, mm -hmm. but often we don't mm -hmm. see the other side, which might be unfinished, which might have carvings on it, which might look rotted, whatever. So you've got your white picket fence, but what's, what's on the other side of that? Because you don't just arrive at wanting to be a counselor and or right. helping people bereaved by suicide. Something has right. to happen. Something gets you to that point. And one of the things that we talk about, one of the main things of this show is talk 
talking about an obstacle in a person's life and overcoming that and how that happens, I'm interested in that because I think that's how we connect to one another and that's how we're going to collectively get over big issues like suicide, uh, untreated mental health issues, socioeconomic issues and beyond. And the more stories that we hear, I think, the more we become empathetic and the more we realize that certain things are bigger problems or more prevalent or that we're not alone, right? So I'm right, curious exactly. about on your way to this white picket fence, yep. what was tugging on what was tugging on you? What prevented you from getting there in in whatever time that it took to get there? And and you may still be dealing with an obstacle or two. So what at least give us a start with one big obstacle that you've had to overcome and how you overcame and, and all that all that business. Well, let me first I want to start out by telling you how much I value and appreciate that this is really the theme of your podcast and your work because absolutely, you know, everybody has an exterior and then everybody has interior stories that led them to that place. So I really believe that, you know, I say with my clients all the time that you are a quilt and your quilt is made up of different patches and each patch is a story that's created your entire blanket. So, yeah, I mean, really good point. I Again, I didn't think this is where life was going to take me at all. You know, I was little and dreamed of living in New York and being a CEO, and I always kind of knew I wanted to be a powerful woman. But I think at the end of the day, if I trace it all back, there was childhood trauma. And that childhood trauma at the time, I don't think I knew was going to catapult me into the position I am now. But when I was, when I was very young, uh, six years old, my mom and I were kidnapped actually. And I was, it was actually carjacked at the time in the seventies, there was not such a thing as a carjacking. So they labeled it a kidnapping. And it was one of those things, you know, dropping my sister off at the mall with a friend approached by two men that had a quote unquote flat tire, asked us to give them a ride to a friend's house. My mom really has you know, but they were your typical good looking, clean cut thinking we're just going to take them a couple blocks. And the next thing you know, I'm sitting in the back seat with a gun to my head. And you know, my poor mother was frantic and panicked. And they were asking her to, you know, drive them to our banks so they could withdraw all of our money. And, you know, as a kid, it's interesting because when I tell people I was six, I think there is this assumption of, thank goodness, she was so small and she really doesn't remember anything. And I'm sure it's a blur. But when you have something traumatic, if it's suicide, if it's an assault, if it's a kidnapping or a car accident, it is interesting how you capture snapshots in your brain. So I really, in my mind, can see the entire thing from beginning to end. And although, again, I was raised in a healthy family, I think that I dealt with it very well. I think that my family dealt with it very well. I've never been ashamed of it. I've never hidden from it. I would tell my high school friends about it because I truly believe it's a part of who I am. You know, at that day and age, in the late 70s, there weren't resources. There wasn't anybody I went to talk to. My parents didn't send me to anyone. There wasn't, it just didn't really exist. So I kind of stuffed a lot of that. And um, in my graduate work in psychology, I had to deal with some of it in my 20s. And then it started coming out again in my 30s. What I realized is I started associating a lot of anxieties with firearms. So I would see a firearm on TV, for example, and it would instantly get pissed, angry, have some type of negative reaction. You know, our media is filled with violence and there's games and every movie has, not every movie, but so many of our movies now have, you know, 10 to 15 headshots in them. And I just, those would elicit, like I would get physically sick to my stomach. Um, and I never knew when these kind of bouts of anxiety were going to pop up. So, you know, somewhere in my 30s, it started taking, it started setting up tent <laughs> in my psyche, in my mind, it was taking up too much space. So, you know, with the guidance of a friend who kind of nudged me and said, you know, you need to go get some help for this. Like you need to, I know you're a counselor and I know you think you're beyond it. So there was, you know, there was some, there was some guilt there. I kind of felt like a fraud. Like I had my own shit I was dealing with and I went to all the schooling and I should know how to help myself. Right. So I had to kind of like set my pride aside and I went and did some real intensive work and it made a huge, huge difference in my life. Huge. Still mm -hmm. overcoming it. But, you know, sure. I think it makes me a better counselor. I think it makes me a more realistic person. I work with people all day long that have experienced crisis and tragedy and trauma. My tragedy and 
trauma may be different than theirs, but I know what it's like to walk around feeling it inside, even though I'm not wearing it on the outside. I didn't know that about you. Obvious to you. I mean, you never told me the story, but... It's kind of it's kind of a party stopper. So we don't really bring it up in conversation, but I'm really not ashamed of it. It's just a lot of people don't know, you know, aside from our field, because we're so giving and loving, a lot of people don't know how to respond or react. So I've just learned not to discuss it. I'm in Ubers all the time. And uh, they ask, you know, I'm on my way to the airport and they ask me what I do. And I, I sometimes I regret it almost because it's like, then I have mm-hmm. to like talk about it before I go do the job and or whatever. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, and sometimes it's cool, but it's like 11 o'clock at night or five in the morning. Right. I really don't want to talk about it. But what I will do is I'll, I'll kind of give them whatever they want. And if they ask more about the backstory and why I got involved in the work, I'll talk to my dad's suicide. And I'll say, yeah. and I'll quantify kind of like with, it's okay, we don't have to stop talking or whatever. Like I have to kind of give them the space to not know how to react and kind of like show them that. Like, exactly. it's okay, you're not the first person to have a weird reaction to right. that, a bad situation. right. right. And that's helping yourself in some way. I mean, it's almost oh God, yeah. to some extent. I'm going to let you off the hook because I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but it's a defense yeah. mechanism for me um, mm-hmm. to let you off the hook because I really shouldn't let you off the hook. I should just let you sit in your shit for a while, but I really don't want to go there and I don't, and, and I'm just an Uber, right? I'm just an Uber, right? I don't want to. Right, right. Yeah. Let's not invest well, in it. I mean, even if even if I'm letting them off the hook, maybe it'll allow them to know how to sit in their shit the next time somebody tells them yeah. something awkward or if, like, grandma has to pull them aside and tell them she's coming out of the closet or whatever. I'm like, oh, my God, grandma, right. no. What about grandpa? Right. Or whatever. You know what I mean? Arbitrary sort of example. <laughs> it's happened, friend. I don't know it's what's happened, happening so. in your family, Josh. Well, not mine. I never... We'll see. Keep you we'll leave it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> closet is tightly shut for many. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of bolts. If one exists. But interesting that you're I don't want to go back to the beginning because there's, there's, there's a few things that I have comments <laughs> and ideas about. But back to your younger self and my family had a had a healthy response and I dealt with it okay or whatever. Yeah, but how did you deal with it? How did they deal with it? How did you come together? Did you deal with it separately together? You're six. So did well, they... Well, okay, let's, let's be real. The healthy response was really no response, but that was so, I realized that that was so par for the course at the time. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. just, there's still a stigma about mental wellness today, Mm -hmm. but 30 years ago, yes, I'm aging myself. Everybody do the math on that. 30 plus six means that I'm at least 36. I'm going to tell you I might be Mm -hmm. maybe two months older than that. Mm. But I mean, but you know, 30 years ago, there really weren't a lot of resources and there really, um, I wasn't having nightmares and I wasn't crying out in my sleep more than anything. I'll tell you, I I was a little girl that felt like she was going to watch her mother being killed in front of her. That Mm. was, you got to think of as six, right? That's your parents are your, are your lifeline and your stability and you love them more than life itself in, in in almost any situation when you're six. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we, both came out okay. And I know it was hard on my siblings. They were scared to death. I know it was hard on my dad. You know, he kind of, we all had a hard time with it, but at the same time, everybody just moved on. I guess that's how we dealt with it. Mm -hmm. But again, like I said, because it was just, you know, it was in the local paper and all of that good stuff. But I think we're, we're strong personalities at my house. So I think we just carried on and my mom led by example and I watched her as a role model, but I know now in my work to never go away. So, mm-hmm. um, it sat dormant for a while. Do you right. see it manifesting itself at all in your family members to this day? No, I really don't. No. Isn't that interesting? So I wonder, yeah. I wonder if I'm, if I'm the only one, but we have had discussions about it in my grad work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in counseling psychology, you're not a good counselor if you don't deal with all of your your own crap. Correct. So that's a good right. portion of your of your graduate work is cleaning out your own closets. So I mean, there were a couple conversations that we had about it, but really, I just knew that I needed to take care of myself. So sure. I kind of walked my own path to clean myself and and to kind of free myself from those panic attacks I was having. And mm. um, you know, I went to great lengths for a while there. I was on a Arizonans for Gun Safety board. I was marching to the Capitol. I was talking to legislatures. I was writing curriculum about mental health and gun safety. I was, you know, that was really my focus. A gun, for some reason, was the enemy. It wasn't the men that kidnapped us, but it, it was a weapon. So, you know, that was part of my process, too. I think I had to work through some of that. You need to remember, I live in the wild, wild west. So I was kind yeah. of 
chasing my tail doing that and going absolutely nowhere. But I needed to go through that process to kind of just feel like I did everything I could to help others and Mm -hmm. to heal myself. And and it's probably, you know what I learned, Josh, that I'm freaking incredibly strong, that I have this amazing inner strength. I've never let that event define me. The exact opposite is I really kind of think that event helped mold me who I am. I've never used it as a deficit ever. And I think it gives me a greater understanding and connection with people. I think maybe that's why it feels so second nature for me to connect with people in their toughest hour, if that makes sense. It does, because you have a choice to how you want to frame any situation that happens to you, be it not getting the ice cream at the grocery store because they're all out up to a traumatic event. We get a chance to (laughs) choose how to frame it, right? And you chose to frame it as, I'm going to help people through this, whether they like it or not. No, you didn't say that, but... but Kind of. (laughs) Yeah, kind of. I didn't want to actually say it. Yeah, Um, kind (laughs) of. Come on. I'm going to help you, you idiot. Now, come with me. <laughs> um, you kind of, through your your dialogue, you, you kind of cut out about five questions that I had, which is, which is really kind of cool. <laughs> so this is going to be a seven-minute interview. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just actually, this is this isn't really. It's just a question because I I just want to dig deep on it, and, and yeah. it doesn't matter what the answer is. But would you quantify? I'm an open book. Mm-hmm. Sweet, sweet pop up book, ladies and gentlemen. Not too much literature. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Good night, Moon. Conversation um, piece book, people. Yes, it's coffee table. <laughs> anyway, Mm-mm. so would you quantify your response, or I don't know if you still have any sort of response to firearms in the way that you had it at one point, but would you quantify mm-hmm. that as post-traumatic stress, or was Absolutely. it just something you had to work through? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yes, and th- great pickups from your perspective. You know, at the time, I didn't know that's what it was. Of course, I didn't know right. that's what it was. Um, I think even through grad school, I didn't know what it was. I Once I had my first child. Of course, my firstborn was a boy. Every single thing he picked up, he wanted it to be a weapon. And I would really probably only prior to having my first child, I would probably only have a meltdown about twice a year. And it would be weird and would never make sense because I just truly, I truly, honest to God, happen to be one of the most sunshiny people you've ever met. I mean, I just, I love life and I love laughing and I love music and, you know, all of those things. So when I would have a meltdown, it would be very bizarre. Um, But I could handle twice a year, right? And then I had a boy Hmm. and every blade of grass was a gun and every sheet of paper that he found on my, you know, office desk, he could turn into a weapon. And it didn't matter how much I tried to sway him and the other. I mean, that was like my motto. I wasn't going to let him. Oh, please. He's now 18 years old. He plays like whatever, Grand Theft Auto and kills zombies all freaking day long. Like (laughs) I gave that up after a while, but that was a real, when he was younger and when he turned between six and eight, that was a trigger for me because that's the age I was. So I could look at him and say, oh my gosh, he comprehends so much of the world. Like he understands so much. He is so aware of his surroundings. I knew that much and I could comprehend that much. And what would I do right now? Like I would put myself back. What would I do right now? If he and I, and I, how would I try to protect him? How would I, and then I had a lot of empathy towards my mom. Like, did she go through all of this? So that time was really scary and kind of brought it right up to the surface. And that's when I started doing a lot of my gun work, but it was definitely post-traumatic stress. So I did some EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, which is a very, very impactful therapy process. It's very easy. It's so easy, Um, but it really, all it did was kind of tap in to the event itself at the age. That's how your brain remembers it. So my brain kind of locked that memory away as a six-year-old little girl. And so the EMDR, which they use for post-traumatic stress, which they use for vets that are coming home from battle, the EMDR tapped into that six-year-old girl and basically let her tell her story, expel it, vomit it out, stomp on it, you know, and wash it away. And so it really Mm -hmm. doesn't have as much power over me anymore. I know the EMDR treatment and it doesn't work for everybody, but the people that it does work in, it's a really, really powerful treatment. And and, and sort of a side note, I, I had something traumatic happen in my life within the past two years, and I didn't know this, but I, so I'd started to get back to playing some piano, and I really suck at it, but like, it's fun. I can, I can make mo- both hands move at the same time, certain songs or whatever. But when I would get stressed out, I would start playing, that was one of my coping skills was piano, 
And I mm. told a counselor friend of mine, and she said that it's very similar to the EMDR treatment and what you're doing because there's the hand-eye coordination and there's different yes. things going on. And I was like, that's freaking fascinating. Like, right? um, I don't know if there's any studies, but like, if, if that can be incorporated in some way, either into art therapy with the definitive sort of like, this is just like EMDR in this sense and that sense, and this is why it can be helpful, yada, yada, yada. So I was like, that's freaking cool. And then we'll have to take a, we'll, you know, some EMDR piano, maybe some EMDR accordion. I don't know. That seems like the only other uh, <laughs> symbol. Get an EMDR, EMDR mariachi. Well, <laughs> it's interesting that you've said that in alignment with music because I've never thought of that. Although, like I said, music for me is therapeutic, not playing it, but listening to it. So, yeah. But I do know that being creative is very therapeutic and I consider you to be exceptionally creative. But I said, you know, at the beginning of the show that I'm I'm also an indoor cycling instructor. I'm a spin, I'm a spin instructor. Right. Another mental health professional had pointed out to me about 10 years ago, maybe a little less, that actually spinning is a form of EMDR. It's repetitive movement. So it's left, right, left, right, left, right, just in different rhythms and different patterns. So it is really, and no wonder I like it so much. You know, right. lots of things are therapeutic, not just talk therapy yeah. and certainly not just mm-hmm. medications. That's the bottom line, right? right? Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I love that you said that and brought that to light because that's what I, when I give my presentations, whether it's the curriculum that I have or if it's just a straight up speaking event, there's a couple things I do. And uh, often one of the questions is sort of a trick question, like everybody raise their hands to in the, who in the room has mental health, and, like folks or, you know, kids or adults or whoever, half of them will start raising their hands. Some people start putting their hands up and like look around the room, like grimacing. I'm like, all right, good, great. Everyone put your hands down. The truth, here's the answer. Trick question. Everybody has mental health, not exclusively mental illness and then we'll talk about coping skills Mm, you know often i'll talk about coping skills and it's like it's hugging your puppy at the end of the day it's going for a run it's climbing that tree it's playing the piano these are mental health this is mental health you got it it's not just talking it's not just medication and and then the the quantifiable thing i do with medication because i take medication thanks for reminding me i gotta take take it after we get off but uh (laughs) is that it works in conjunction with therapy you can't go and just get some medication from your primary care physician of your psychiatrist and say, well, maybe it'll work in four weeks or I'll start to feel better. You hmm. know, it works hand in hand with talk therapy and it works hand mm-hmm. in hand with the other things that you do. There's no sort of, I mean, would you do that if you had diabetes or a kidney disease? No, you have to continue to stay on it. So the thing that's really solutions. interesting that you just brought up is that our society and our culture thinks that you can just pop a pill and be good, right? I, I think I'm, I'm so glad you just said that. Let's just keep patting each other on the back, Josh. Cause you know, I'm, I'm a fan. Yeah. You you and I are talking. like energy, buddy. Oh. This is the problem. You and I are like energy. But but yeah. I I have a real issue in my field of mental health, especially in grief. I have so many clients that are feeling so desperate that they'll go right to their general practitioner and they'll get a pill, but that they don't follow it up with talk therapy because I think there's this great misunderstanding that you can pop a pill and it's going to make everything better. Well, it's 50% as effective to your point if you don't. Mm-hmm. couple that with talk therapy and you don't hike and you don't, you know, again, hang out with your pets or go to a sporting event or yeah, it's a process. It's, there's never just one answer. You have to do the work.com. That's what it is. You got to put in the work. (laughs) You know? com. So, dot com, dot edu. Dot com. Right. Dot com. So Amen. Praise. We have very much, yeah, we've very much established that you have in your life with the traumatic events, and uh, and there's been other events uh, that, that you've been through, but at least this one specifically, that you have learned and utilized the ability to turn lemons into lemonade and lemon chicken and lemon meringue pie and maybe some limoncello. <laughs> I know you like to get your drink on a little bit. Yum, yum. That's Cool. Mm-hmm. We can reduce that and make a sauce out of it too, because I watch a little too much Food Network. <laughs> But you got that thing going on, and that's cool, and and I applaud you, and that's a big part of this show. But what I want to do now is switch gears for a second. I want to yeah. go to what I like to call... Switch it up, baby. Our, yeah. All right. Say word. All right. So we're going to do our quick fire round. Oh. And this is kind of like Inside the Actors Studio or Jimmy Fallon Tonight Show or Conan, and there's just some fun questions. There's no right or wrong I'm like fidgeting in my seat. I'm getting so excited. Yeah. Good. I'm yeah. ready. All right. Here we go. And I might come comment too so we should i might need to call this quickish fire around because i make comments and stuff and we'll see we'll see how it goes all right Mm -hmm. 
Tom. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Do, your, do your vocal exercises. <laughs> All right. Here we go. We got that out of the Bring way. Bring it. Jill, what is your favorite word? Uh, you know this. It's motherfucker. I just have to own it. it is, I say it way too much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's not even a, you know what that's great about that word? It's not even a hyphenated anymore. I think it, it's in the dictionary. It's just that, depending on the dictionary that you want, specifically urban dictionary, but I know there's other weird ones. That, <laughs> I huh. wouldn't even care if it was in the dictionary. I think it belongs in Doesn't every matter. paragraph. <laughs> it is a great descriptor. It, it's an adverb, an adjective, it's past tense, future tense. Sometimes it's tense, a noun and that's not a good thing. No. Yeah, okay, so to that end, what is your least favorite word? I can't say it. It's just bad. It's Can a bad word. It? it begins with a P. It ends with a Y. Oh. I hate that okay. word. I shouldn't even say yeah. that. Like, that. you can't even, you need oh, to edit really? that out. It's bad. Oh, I'm going to keep it because we know what it is. It's pansy. And, it's a horrible um, word. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, pansy. That's what it is. I actually I actually like the word in, <gasps> when it's in the proper context. And, oh, and that okay. word, well, I'm not going to say it to you because I know no, that. No, you know, you better not. But, but Relationship's over. Guess, well. We'll see about that. <laughs> I'll force you to be my friend. Mm-hmm, I actually mm-hmm. had a I had a guest who actually that was their favorite word, and and I did a, <gasps> I did let them say it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Was it a man? So, was it a man yeah, or a woman? It was. Yeah. No, it was. It's a man. Oh. Words disgusting. All right. Oh please. <laughs> oh, I'm like my grandma. Right. right. But never met. I own it. It's my own thing. You're good. You're good. No, you're good. It's cool. All right. If somebody made a movie of your life, a lifetime movie, it can't be another kind of movie where they'd use that word. But if if somebody made a movie of your bleep, exactly, that's the name of Mm -hmm. the movie. So if somebody made a movie of your life, who would play the title role? I think it would have to be, um, she's old, blonde. Meg Ryan? Yes. Thank you. I'm so sorry. It would have to be Meg Ryan. I was like, not Meg Meg Trainer. She's like 18. Oh, no. (laughs) And not that. that, Not the Megan that's in Transformers. That's hot as hell, Make but I hot. just don't like her as a person. I think she's not a nice human being. So yeah, mm. I'm gonna say Meg Ryan because I kind of like her mojo. I like her energy. I think she mm. can be serious. I think she can be soft. I think she can be hard. I think she can be goofy. I mm. I just like what that woman represents. Mm-hmm. Except she's I older than I am. Let's just be clear. Let's just be clear. She's older. That's that's okay. So, that's okay. I just we, wanted to own can, that. We, I want to. We can have her do flashbacks. She can play the future you, and then we'll have somebody right. play. Yes. Back. Yeah. We'll we can have with... like Ariana Grande. Ariana. Grande Grande can be my current self. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, ooh, it smells like... No, it'd be Meg Ryan. Here. It'd be Meg Ryan. I love her. <laughs> I loved her back in the day. Yeah, she was great back in the day. I haven't seen much of her lately, but... Well, right, because she's, she's uh, old, but... Yeah, I, I she's good say, energy, they're, they're, Josh. She's good energy. As are right? you. You're good energy. Right. That's why I like her. Speaking, speaking of energy, mm-hmm. next question. Who or what is your spirit animal? Okay. Well, see, I think you're going to have to help me through this because I was not keen on the whole spirit animal thing until my 13-year-old daughter had a sleepover and her friend walks up to me and goes, Miss Jill, what spirit animal are you? I'm a coyote. And see, mm. I'm going to say the word now. I was looking at her like, what the fuck are you talking about? See, I just said the word. So <laughs> I don't I don't know what my spirit animal is. I know I'm right. spiritual. So, so for the record, I didn't ask you whether you liked the question. <laughs> 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 oh, 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 don't make me pull the word um, out again, Josh. Don't make yeah. me do it. Exactly. My favorite word, insert it here. <laughs> so your spirit animal could be anybody or anything, right? Truly. Like your spirit animal could be a kangaroo because they hop around and, and have a pouch and, and like to kickbox. Or it could be it could be Angela <laughs> Merkel because she's the badass prime minister of Germany and she knows how to make a mean casserole. Like, I don't know, whoever you want or whatever yes. you want. An amoeba, doesn't matter. Whatever you got. So... My spirit animal, I think, then, would, if I'm sticking with the animal theory, would probably be an owl. Um, They're wise. They're cool. They kind of can view everything. And you Mm -hmm. know what? Have you seen how far those heads can rotate? Like, their eyes are on everything. They can observe everything. They know what's going down, yet they can communicate across the neighborhood. Like, two of them can talk for hours, blocks Mm -hmm. apart. And I am the world's biggest loudmouth. So, (laughs) I mean, yeah. Yeah. And I also, you know, I also think they're also good therapists. They're always asking who. And so, you ask a lot of questions. (laughs) That was a stupid joke. How many licks on that lollipop? Mm -hmm. Oh, are we getting back to the Well, you took me there. Come on. All right. (laughs) Hey. 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 Yeah, okay. I'm toning it down. I'm going to have to edit this out. I I might have to. My wife's going to... You're not going to edit it out. Come on now. No, I'm not. I know you're (laughs) like, baby, don't listen to this episode. Nice try, Hollywood. Nice try. I know you. Mm -hmm. 
All right, I think I got one more question in me. So, yep. Joe, if heaven exists, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say to you as you enter or as you get kicked out? <laughs> wow, that's deep. That one actually is, that one's really easy for me. You asked me the spirit animal and I'm like, I don't know. Um, that one's easy for me. I would really just love for him to look at me and say, good job, kid. Nice. That's it. I like that. All, that's all oh. I want. That's all I want. Okay. I dig it. Yeah. I, think, I think we can bank on that. Go right. That's what I'm working towards. That's what I'm working towards, Josh. Yeah, hell yeah. Same here. Same here. Leave this place better when you find it. Amen. Amen. So that's the end of our quick fire round. Jill, what, is, what do you think the next like six months to a year holds for you? Business life, whatever you want to share. You know, I'm gonna re- you said the word energy before, and I'm in a really good place right now, and I'm feeling very um, energetic. So the next six months, I have big plans for myself. I'm, uh, as soon as I get off the, the phone slash podcast with you, I'm going to go look for some new office space for my... So I do work right. for a nonprofit, and I do have my own private practice. So I'm hoping to really just kind of... Um, kind of harness this energy that I'm feeling right now and move Mm -hmm. myself forward to the next step because we don't always feel confident. We don't always feel good. And I do right now. And so I want to use that Mm -hmm. to kind of like, you know what, leave the fear behind. I'm going to start, I want to start training more nationally and internationally. I'm supposed to partner with somebody to finish a book by the end of the year. All of those things that that Mm -hmm. I have said for years that I've wanted to do, but I haven't wanted to commit the time or energy or maybe in my head, I I know, yeah, I'm never really going to do that. Like I'm doing all of that before the end of 2017. Brilliant. And I feel that I'm really going to do it. Yeah. 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 I think you're going to kick some ass. So Jill, if people want to get in touch with you, want to follow your work, follow you, maybe pick up a spin class, maybe pick up your book when it comes out. What's a great way for people to get in touch if if they, if they so want to do that? Probably my website. Um, It's been in existence for a long time, but I'm actually updating it um, within 2017 as well. So it's jillmcmahoncounseling.com and Mm -hmm. um, McMahon, like you said before, I have no relationship to Vince, Ed or Jim, but it's MC. C M A H O N. So Jill McMahon Counseling dot com. All sorts of goodness on there. Rocking. I love it. Jill, thank you so much again for joining us today. This is awesome. It was a pleasure, my friend. You've been listening to the I'm Possible Project Show with Joshua Rivetall and guest Jill McMahon. I love sharing stories and how to turn impossible into I'm possible. If you want more inspirational stories, our second and third books are in pre-order right now. Changing Minds, Breaking Stigma, Achieving the Impossible, as well as Lemonade Stand. Both contain powerful stories of overcoming tremendous odds. When life gives you lemons, squeeze, add sugar, and pick up a copy of The I'm Possible Project. www.iampossibleproject.com slash pre-order. Thank you so much for tuning in. You're more than a community. You're part of the I'm Possible family. Until next time, sending you lots of love.